BB Washburn recycles discarded materials, such as two by fours and cardboard boxes found in dumpsters, alleyways, and businesses around her Brooklyn neighborhood. She cuts her material into roughly uniform sizes and then pieces them together, or builds them in her studio, as I saw when I visited last year, to create loosely designed constructions. She takes her materials from the world of manufacturing, which may suggest a comment on the profusion and waste of consumer culture. However, she says her recycling of material is not born from an ecological standpoint, but involves skimming off of other industries. She uses things that are already worn, already marked, and discarded. I think many of our students who dumpster dive will sympathize with this, this policy. She modestly describes her installations as clumsy, labored, slow-growing events. However, her installations at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania and her installation at the Whitney Biennial, both in 2007, and her recent show at Zach Foyer Gallery in New York City show otherwise. Her handmade installations have an elegance of form and architecture while exuding a haphazard and precarious appeal. The final installation, in the words of Phoebe herself, remind us of beavers building a dam. She lets the structures evolve by repeating the same action over and over, adding water, plant, dirts, and other small objects to create a playful, enormous landscape structured for us to play in. Phoebe received her undergraduate degree from Tulane University and her MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Phoebe Washburn. Thank you. Um, does everything sound okay before I get started? It's all good? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me here today. I had a really great day visiting your studios, and um, I'm really happy to be here tonight to share with you my projects. Um, when I put together this lecture, I, I guess I first want to say that I'm focusing entirely on large-scale installations. I do also make smaller sculptures, drawings, and photographs, but um, I have a lot of work to show tonight, and there's just not enough time to like really get into everything, so I'm focusing on the installations. And um, I guess the other thing I want to say is that I have, uh, I prioritize projects that I think nicely show a connection from one project to the next and kind of hopefully this will all sort of flesh out all the connective tissue um, between the projects through the years. And in some cases I'm showing some projects that are less successful than others, um, but I, I feel that that's important because oftentimes being in an awkward moment or kind of making some mistakes is the very thing that leads you to the next project when you are forced to kind of address some of those problems. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, I'm going to get right to it because I have um, kind of a lot of work to show. Uh, so this, this project was the first project that I did out of graduate school. Um, I, I did this at the Rice University Gallery in Houston, Texas, and the title of this piece is True, false, and slightly better. And the year was 2003. Um, it's quite a large piece. It was about maybe 43 feet wide, 36 feet, 43 feet long, 36 feet wide, and I think at the tallest point it was 16 feet tall. And to physically describe it, it's just like a very large, undulating, um, rigid cardboard blanket that's propped up in the space. It's attached to the three walls um, <clears throat> and it kind of just um, hangs in the space, is propped up and jerry-rigged underneath. Um, you can see the scaffolding that's propping it up. There's two by fours propping it up. It dips and undulates and there's a platform that viewers could you know, go, go up a set of stairs and step, stand on this platform and kind of stare into the abyss of all this mass. It was composed out of thousands of pounds of uh, cardboard, which I had collected over the course of about a year and a half. Uh, painted, all the pieces of cardboard were painted individually on one side, cut into these strips, and then packed and shipped to the gallery. And then uh, there was a crew of 11 of us, uh, basically uh, standing in the, like around the perimeter of the room, layering this cardboard together, kind of like compressing it, feathering it together, screwing it together, and kind of just making this rigid, Form. Um, <clears throat> so it was really, it was really like a pretty amazing experience for me because uh, once I was asked to do this project, I, I had I had worked on a few cardboard pieces um, before, but this forced me to 
take a giant leap in scale. Uh, it also involved like uh, planning for several months. I had never been in charge of a crew of assistants. Uh, it was a 21-day installation, which is insane. Um, and it was really, like, I, I learned so much during this process. One of the things that I was struck by was how much I enjoyed the energy in the room as we were building this. I, I loved how each day the, the room changed, how things were, you know, growing, and, and there was new materials brought in, and we were solving problems right there, um, you know, Hold, trying to get this thing to stay in the air, hanging in the air, um, and and I really just I loved I loved how um, I loved how the piece was was um, sort of in a way telling its own story. So I wanted to um, hopefully have the piece retain that as much as possible. So pretty much anything that happened in the room during the course of the installation, I tried to pack into the piece. So this is a really good example of that. That's scaffolding poking out of the surface of the cardboard, and that very scaffolding was the scaffolding that we were standing on as we were building this thing, and as we were layering the cardboard, it literally kind of like grew in the space, and we backed out of the room. So it, it in a very literal way, like absorbed things in the room. And I thought that was just so beautiful, the way it was like, it was, it was like this glacier sort of rolling through the space and it was absorbing things in its path and it was really uh, like telling its own story. This is a view from underneath. So viewers, I guess I didn't mention this, but viewers could you know, completely orbit it, walk underneath it, walk up that platform that you saw earlier. And everything was sort of on display. I, 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 uh, I enjoyed that there was this, the top side had this very kind of beautiful pastel sort of painterly, if you will, like quality to it um, with all the sort of like strata. But then the underside was much more rough and kind of rugged and there, you know, the two by fours were left in place. Everything was just there as, just as we had, you know, sort of quickly jerry-rigged it up. And I, I liked that there were two very different qualities to the piece too. There was sort of an A side and a B side. Um, <clears throat> this is a detail of, of the surface, of the top surface. And um, I had purchased these surveyor flags at a hardware store. It was sort of just a compulsive purchase when I was gathering materials before the installation. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with them, but they actually came in handy because at the end of each workday, I would stab the flags in the, into the surface of the cardboard in order to chart our progress to make sure that we were on schedule, that we were going to you know, finish in time. And so I left them in the piece, and they became these markers of, of time and distance. Just another detail of the underneath. So this sort of nicely explains how this thing ended. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it, we attached the cardboard to the, to the walls, to three of the walls in the gallery, and there was 11 of us. And then as time went by, the crew got smaller, and this is the last day. I'm literally like closing up this hole, and I had to crawl out of the piece. And I, I loved that it ended in a very like logical, natural way. The piece had its own sort of, its own growth pattern. I mean, we were kind of like, you know, packing it and guiding it and screwing it together, but it really, it really was like this event over time. And it wasn't until many years later that I really became interested in this idea of an exhibition as an event or an installation as an event, but these were things that I was just sort of learning about at this time and that I definitely was, you know, I was excited about these ideas. So this is um, a shot of the studio that I had at the time, and I just, I show these sort of preparation shots just to like, <laughs> drive home the point that I was preparing for this project in a really low-tech, extremely inefficient way. Um, I started working with cardboard just because I was sort of lazy and like wandering around looking for a material to work with and I brought back a bundle of cardboard to my studio and just started tinkering with it and it sort of evolved into this, into all of these cardboard projects. But um, So I'd bring the cardboard back, whatever I could carry, paint it, you see my little painting station there, paint it, and then cut it into the strips. And then um, eventually, when I was preparing for the project in Houston, I had to like pack it up and send it to a storage unit before it shipped down to the inst for the installation. So this is a shot of my studio um, as I was packing all this material up. And I really began to 
love this, this way that I was working, there were a few things that I was really enjoying. First of all, a lot of my work was not exclusively studio work. I was out in the city. I was, I was paying attention to the recycling times. I was meeting people. I was um, you know, observing people's behavior. I knew when the good time of the day was to go out and find cardboard. I knew which neighborhoods and which stores put good cardboard out. And I just found all these little stories kind of interesting. I was meeting people on loading docks and you know, kind of just all these little narratives were starting to happen in my process, and I was, I was enjoying that. The other thing that I really enjoyed was the fact that I was, because I was doing this in a really inefficient way, I was bringing all this material in in batches and painting it in batches and packing it up in batches, and I had this sort of little industry in my studio that I found really interesting. I, I liked this way of working. And then the, th the third thing that I realized is that this was pretty much the only way I could wrap my brain around accomplishing this project. I mean, there clearly is an easier way to gather cardboard. I could have done a little research and called a recycling plant and had a truckload, you know, dumped into my studio and, and you know, painted it with a crew of people and sprayers or whatever. And I was doing this the total, like, slow, humble way. But it was the only way I could, I think, manage it. Um, I think I would completely have been overwhelmed by the idea of having to collect 7,000 pounds of anything. And, and so this was my way of like, you know, doing, have each, knowing what I had to do each day and just doing that and setting, setting up a little, like a, a, a set of chores and, and, a, and a system. And so it was my way of like kind of getting through this process. So after several cardboard installations, I kind of shifted to working in a similar way, but working with wood. And this is a drawing that I did for, uh, an installation, I'll show that in just a second. Um, <clears throat> so it was, it was pretty, like, it was pretty, a pretty natural step for me. I mean, as I was out collecting cardboard, oftentimes right next to a pile of cardboard, there's a little pile of wood and a little pile of newspaper, and I began collecting all of these things because they were equally, like, they were cousins to me. They were, you know, they're equally humble, they're easy to gather, um, and they were also pretty easy to transform without, like, a huge amount of effort. I mean, with a coat of paint, I could make them my own. And so I started, I started collecting wood as well. So I'm gonna show you a few of those projects next. So this is the actual piece um, that, I, uh, that the study was for. And um, these slides are the path of the viewer walking through the gallery. And um, I tend to show, several of the projects will, will be shown in a similar way when I talk about the path of the viewer. This is sort of like how, you're, how people typically like, would walk and move around the piece. Um, the title of this piece is Nothing's Cutie, and this is, this was a year later, this is 2004, at um, the Zach Foyer Gallery when it was on 24th Street, and the rough dimensions of this are about 20 feet by 20 feet by, I have 12 feet, at the, uh, 12 feet tall. So um, the reason why this is sort of flooded out with light is that this is the, the gallery doors being opened. So as a viewer, you step in and you kind of feel like you're on the back side of something and you kind of walk underneath this somewhat treacherous looking canopy, I guess, of hanging pieces of wood, pass under this folding table with a little welcome note and kind of come around the corner to the more quote unquote sort of pictorial view of the piece. Again, I was sort of interested in this idea of like a back side, a front side, an A or B side, to two different sort of views of, of the same piece. So um, this is quite similar to the cardboard in that it's you know, an accumulation of all this material, but it actually was built in the exact like, sort of reverse, um, in the reverse way. Uh, whereas the cardboard was attached to the perimeters of the gallery and grew in the space, this had uh, you know, a, a core in it, and we started in the center of the room and just added the wood and attached it and it grew out into the space. Um, and that actually sort of ultimately presented a problem for me. This is, this is one of the projects that I feel like there were definitely some, um, some mistakes and some failures in it. And uh, I think the thing that, I'll jump ahead, here's another view of it. Um, the thing that was the main problem for me with this project was that um, I had sort of forgotten about the architecture of the gallery. And I was so focused on you know, just building this thing in time that I, it just sort of ended arbitrarily. That's sort of why I don't have any good shots of the entire piece. Um, I'll back up. This is, well, there are two reasons. It was so big, it was hard to back up and get a good view of it. But the other reason was that it just, like the, the borders of this piece sort of just 
bled and bled dry in a way. And um, I, I found that that was a huge problem um, with this way of working. You have to have, or I felt that I was lacking like a strong sort of defined uh, experience or um, environment. And so it was something that nagged me. And unfortunately, it was one of those situations where I was out of time and I had to live with this. And so this is sort of the thing that led me to the next series of work, um, this sort of mistake that prompted me to continue working and sort of figure this problem out. So I also want to mention that like the, the beach scene, the little miniature beach scene, is um, sawdust. And again, I was trying to like retain everything uh, that happened in the room, all of the byproduct, pack it into the piece somehow, aestheticize it, make it all, make the piece completely responsible for itself. So um, the rules were, you know, anything that happened in the room stayed in the piece and we tried to make use of it. Okay, so this is sort of the second generation of that same piece, um, but me trying to work out some of those like formal issues that I was struggling with before. I was asked to be in a group show at the American Academy of Arts and Letters um, in Washington Heights in, um, in New York. And it was a group show, and the space was phenomenal. There had these amazing, like, sort of, it was, it, the space was, um, the architecture was like classical and, and sort of like grandiose. And so I, um, I knew I wanted to pay close attention to the architecture and work off of it and really um, you know, address some of the problems that I was struggling with before. So this is the, the back of the piece. Um, I pushed the piece into this uh, archway in the gallery and so that when you entered the space, you kind of, um, you were clearly walking around the back side of something. So it was this large, basically like a bowl um, pushed into this um, architectural niche. And then when you came around the, here's the work table. There's always work tables left in my pieces somehow. So when you come around the turn, you peer into this um, interior sort of like um, open cavity. And unfortunately this image is not that great. It kind of flattens it out, but it was, it was really this like wonderful like panoramic sort of view. So um, yes. So the dimensions of this piece were about uh, 20 feet by 20 feet by 14. Okay, so this is the next project. And um, this shot is taken at the Sculpture Center in Long Island City. And I, um, the summer of 2005, I was in a group show. Um, and at this point, I was sort of questioning that maybe I had fallen into a bit of a formula with my work. And the formula was like, go out into the city, collect material, whether it be cardboard or wood or newspaper, paint it, cut it up, send it to a site, you know, install something. I was sort of feeling like maybe that was, that was feeling too familiar. Um, and I wasn't ready to totally dismantle that, but I wanted to like, to examine that and question it and kind of poke at it. So my idea for this project was that I was gonna try to do everything on site, um, including generate the mass of material. So this is a picture of the um, courtyard, this, the sculpture courtyard outside of the sculpture center, and I decided that I was going to harvest the gravel um, <clears throat> in the courtyard and, and paint it as I had the other materials. But you know, do do this do this activity on site. So I was there for two weeks before the actual installation started, generated all of this painted gravel, and then made the piece that was in the group show. So here's the material, and here is the piece. Again, I used the same sort of um, strategy of pushing the piece up into the corner of the room so that um, this is the view from the, the main gallery. So the, the view that you get when you're in the group show is really the back of the piece. And it's not until you leave the sculpture center, walk outside, walk through the courtyard, and open up a fire exit door and step inside this little area that you, view, that you get to view the more pictorial side of the piece. So this project was really exciting for me and really important because um, because I was, you know, sort of like questioning the formula that I'd been working in before and doing everything on site, I was really like excited about the idea of compressing this idea of like, like these ideas of a production and a sculpture and maybe even creeping 
towards this idea of a sculpture producing itself in some way, um, not only telling the story of its own making, but actually like taking ownership of its own production in some way. Obviously, I, I harvested this gravel. I mean, the, the piece wasn't at all producing itself, but I was just, I had eliminated the step of the studio, and that was really important for me. I also really loved that this piece was dependent on this fire, the function of the fire exit door. So the piece was literally like attached to the building. Um, and then the third thing I really loved about this project, and probably the Sculpture Center didn't really love this, but I loved that I was there for so long and that I knew everyone's like, you know, schedule. I knew the names of all the people there. I knew where to go get lunch. I was just like, I had kind of like put roots down in the institution. And I just, I found that really interesting. I think they were really happy to see me go after it was finally all over. But I just liked that the piece was really literally like attached and on many different levels to the site. The problem with this piece is that this is not all that interesting to look at. The actual pictorial landscape sort of fell flat, but um, I, ha I think it was a really great learning experience for all the other reasons that I just mentioned. The, the actually most interesting about, thing about this project was that when the fire exit door slammed shut, you can see in this photo here the gravel that's on the ground. Um, when, the, when the door slammed shut, the gravel would trickle down and it alerted people on the other side of the piece that there was like some sort of activity going on behind there. So there was this like, you know, a spontaneous sort of sound thing happening, which I did not plan for, but that was probably the most interesting thing about the piece. The title of this piece is Poor Man's Lobster. And again, the dimensions are similar to, um, to the dimensions from the previous project I showed you. It was about 20 feet in length, 18 feet wide, and maybe 13 feet tall. I've included just a few source images just to sort of like break up the, the monotony of looking at one project to the next. Um, so this is obviously a picture of a beehive. It's my, my grandmother's beehive. And um, I just, I guess, I was beginning to have, have an interest and starting to pay attention to moments where architecture and function and architecture and production were kind of like one and the same. And thinking about those ideas of, of you know, when one is in service to the other or when they're so intertwined that you can't even separate them. So this is a project called It Makes for My Billionaire Status, and the year is 2005, and I did this um, in Los Angeles. And um, the, dimension, the rough dimensions are about like 40 feet long by 25 feet wide by 11 feet tall. And again, this is, um, the, these, the next series of slides are um, the, like the path of the viewer walking through the gallery. So, uh, this is the viewer opening up the gallery door, and you, as, as soon as you opened up the door, you felt like you were underneath something or a part of something. And in fact, you were. This was the underside to the piece. This, this installation had two levels to it, so you were immediately underneath something. And I think that as you, you could either walk to the left or to the right, but we're going to go to the left. So you walked around and kind of started turning this corner, and you were standing inside this. Um, this landscape made out of kind of cobbled together pieces of plywood, um, and then there were growing living plants on top of the structure. So this moment always, when I show this in a slide lecture, it always seems like a radical shift um, because there are suddenly <laughs> live plants in the work. Um, but of course, there were many, many small steps that I took in the studio to get to this point, but I was very interested in this idea of when I spoke before about the piece telling its own story in some way and starting to take ownership for its own making. And so this was a way for me to kind of exercise that more and, and sort of like push that idea um, and to um, be forced to solve problems that were real problems, not just formal problems, but like have to address things like how to, you know, how to keep the plants living for the duration of the exhibition. So I, I was interested in sort of these ideas and also this idea of like, an event happening over time, setting up a system and kind of quote unquote turning it on and seeing what would happen. Um, so all these things were kind of things I was thinking about at the time. The problem with this project is that um, the plants I selected for this piece was really just sort of a hodgepodge of different plants. I was digging up weeds from outside. I was planting grass, planting bird seed, plant, buying some plants, some ivy plants and trying to 
um, you know, sustain those. So it was really sort of like this random assortment, and I didn't really have like a clear relationship with any of these plants, but I knew that it was really, that was sort of besides the point at that time. I mean, I, I see that as like a problem in this project, but I was really just, um, um, the plants were sort of an excuse for, an, for a system. So this is a view from the top. There was a set of stairs, and there was sort of like this catwalk. Um, this is a view of the loft. And you could kind of like walk around, almost completely like orbit this thing on the second level. Um, and it was really, um, this was an amazing project for me in many ways because it was, it was so, um, it was so thrilling. It was so scary. This thing was like an an organism <laughs> that was separate from me that was going to do its own thing, and um, it was really, it was really quite quite something. And it it. it it betrayed me immediately. So the idea was that, um, and I'll explain that in a moment, but the idea was I had hooked up this irrigation system, so a different um, portion of this plant was watered on a different day of the week, and there was a water source at the top, and it, um, there was attached to pumps and hoses, and it would sprinkle different areas of the piece, and of course the water not only drained to the soil, but it drained through the wood, so I had stapled these tarps to the bottom of the piece, and once I learned where the water would accumulate, then I poked holes in the tarps and tried to create this like gutter system to funnel the water back down to a main source and then pump it back up again. So it was this very rudimentary system that I was developing. Um, and it worked for the most part, but it also, would, it kind of got out of control. And um, it was really frustrating and, and kind of crazy, but also really amazing because uh, there were moments where I had to like give in to the piece, and this is one of those moments. So when there were leaks sprouting in the underside of this piece that I couldn't control, I, I finally just had to like give in to it, and I declared those leaks a quote-unquote second-generation watering station, and I would put a plant under them, and then just like you know, the the piece had won at that moment. So. I loved the fact that I was sort of chasing behind this piece and trying to like solve problems and trying to learn about what it was going to do and how it was going to react and, and really like um, I was reacting to it. And it, I very much felt like the first piece that I showed you with the cardboard where the piece like grew in the space and, and, it, and it kind of like just emerged from all like the layering and patching and I crawled out of it. I mean, it was this, this, Obviously, it's a very different piece, but it felt very similar, that sort of energy that I was sort of chasing after. It also, parts of it were thriving wonderfully because there were skylights in the gallery and then other parts were going crazy and like it was way too soggy and there were mushrooms sprouting and there were slugs crawling on the floor. So like the thing was really out of control, but it was, it was like thrilling and totally embarrassing. But it was a wonderful experience because it sort of, you know, it, it, it just was, enabled me to, um, you know, dive into all of these new areas that I was interested in. So this is a, a drawing that I did for um, a project um, for the Whitney Museum Altria space. And so, um, let's see. This is the outside of the piece. This is the interior of the piece. And this is the actual thing. Um, the Whitney used to uh, have this program at um, Philip Morris's um, old uh, corporate uh, space in Midtown Manhattan. You can see that's the Grand Central Station um, in the back on the left-hand side. So um, they had, there was an art program there in the lobby of that building. And as it was explained to me, Philip Morris had too many, off, they had too much office space, and so they were required to like give back a certain amount of public space. So the um, the lobby of the building was opened um, open 24 hours a day, or if, if, maybe I'm not remembering correctly, maybe it was open till midnight, but um, so it was a heavily used public space and they showed art in that um, lobby. So I was really excited about doing a project in this space because I'd never done anything um, in a, you know, a, a public space or quasi-public space before. So um, the year is 2006 and the title of this is Minor In-House Brainstorm. And uh, the dimensions are roughly uh, 30 feet tall by 25 feet wide by 14 feet, um, I'm sorry, 30 feet long by 24 feet wide by 14 feet tall. So um, as I mentioned before, this was a really heavily used public space. During the daytime, there's uh, people having their lunch break there, and it, there's, you know, there's, there's these huge windows there. There's constantly people walking by. I mean, it's just super, super, like, 
loud with information everywhere. Um, and then even in the evening, because it's open um, nearly 24 hours a day, in the wintertime, um, there are often homeless people who come in here to seek shelter and to stay warm. So it's a very intense, kind of strange, but wonderful place. So I was inspired by the fact that it was so heavily used and it felt like a public park in a way. I mean, I know that's a stretch, but my idea was to create a park within a park. So um, this is the structure and on the inside, this is another view of it, on the inside, there are ponds and plants and lights sustaining the plants. And I was kind of creating this sort of like pond landscape picturesque sort of view on the inside. And the, the idea was that I was creating this space that was sealed off to the public. People did not go inside there, but you could view it through several windows. And I wanted to make something that was, you know, a giant footprint, yet also ultimately when you were viewing the sort of pictorial side, you were viewing it in a very traditional sort of Paint, you know, painterly way. I mean, it was, you know, it was sort of these framed out views. So I wanted to sort of like take those two ideas and compress them together in this project. So for this slide, the photographer has actually gone inside the structure. So it's not actually an accurate uh, view that the audience would see. And again, with this one, the photographer went up to the top and just uh, looked down, but people didn't actually see it from, I guess if you were up in an office, maybe you could see this view. But So um, the thing that was most interesting about this project for me was that because it was in this public space and there was maintenance that had to be done on this piece, the, the maintenance was done in full view, you know, in front of people. And um, I just found that kind of curious that I had, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it up, up until this point. I'd made several pieces that used that you know, um, used plants and therefore required some maintenance, but it was always sort of done after hours. But this one, you know, that, that wasn't possible. So um, it just, it kind of like dawned on me that of, of course that was not only okay, but that should be folded into the piece conceptually. Um, because you know, none, of, none of these structures are like illusionistic in any way. And you know, that you can, with close observation, you can understand how they're built, the structures revealed, the scaffoldings revealed. So it just made sense that if the, you know, if I was gonna sort of stay true to that logic, if a piece required maintenance, then the maintenance should be part, part of the piece on every level. So I had to like build all the tools and the, the equipment for maintaining this, pack it into the piece and sort of aestheticize it. And, and um, you know, that, that was kind of like an interesting lesson. And, and it sort of also reinforced this, this idea that like maybe I was starting to become interested in more performative aspects of the pieces. So this was sort of like the interesting lesson for that project. Um, this is a, the initial drawing that I did for a, um, for a project that was a commission piece for the Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin. And this was the sort of initial concept drawing for the project. It looks a little bit like a roller coaster with little plots of grass going around on the loop. So this was the first drawing, and this is sort of a structural drawing, one of the initial drawings I did for the project. Um, and this is actually the piece in, on site. The title of this is um, Regulated Fool's Milk Meadow, and the year is 2007. And as I said before, this was at Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin, and the dimensions of this piece are, it was quite large. It was about 80 feet long, 21 feet wide, and at the tallest point, 14 feet tall. So um, it's basically like a very simple form. It's a, it's a wedge. In the front, it's only four feet tall, and in the back, it's 14. So it's just sort of dumb form, sitting right in the middle of the space, taking up nearly all of the space in the gallery. Inside this is a conveyor belt loop uh, that's making a complete closed circle. And on this loop uh, sit these boxes of grass that you see here on the roof, or sod. This is a view of the back of the structure. So there were two entrances um, in the back, with you know, this little two sets of staircases. You could enter into the interior room inside this structure. And in, uh, so here's a, here's a view of the conveyor belt loop with the, with the grass on it. So viewers actually never went into this smaller area. Um, the conveyor belt itself was sort of in a little tunnel. So each day of the exhibition, this thing was constantly cycling around. And um, the idea was that this was creating or simulating the ideal growing conditions for this grass. So it passed under grow lights, it passed under a little watering station, the grass passed by um, fans that were supposed to be drying the grass. 
um, after it got sprinkled. It was sort of like a car wash slash grass factory. So there were um, three gardeners tending to this um, three, uh, diff three different days during the week. And the idea was that they were pulling the mature grass out of the conveyor belt loop, putting it onto the roof, uh, sowing new sods, new boxes of sod, putting them in a greenhouse, and then replacing um, the, the boxes in the loop. So it was constantly being replenished. I said that in a very strange way, but the, the grass is constantly being replenished. Right now you're looking at a view of the watering uh, station. So this thing would advance a certain amount of boxes, and then this water would sprinkle down onto the, onto the sod, so that by the end of each day, each plot of grass was watered just once. So as I was, as I was like researching what would go in this factory, I knew I wanted to, to build a factory that was going to take ownership in its own production in some way. I wasn't quite sure about what plant would be inside the factory, and I was pretty sure it was grass, but you know, I, I, did, I did some research, and I came across this picture as I was uh, doing research, and I just thought it was interesting, um, sort of just like the power of grass. I mean, this is obviously, this is a, a soldier who's stationed in Iraq, and he, the story was that he you know, missed grass so much that he had someone send him some seeds, and he planted this plot outside of his, um, outside of his barracks. So um, I knew, that, I knew that grass, well, I selected grass for a few reasons. The first reason was that formally it does this kind of cool thing where it looks the same at a distance as it does up close. So there's sort of like micro, macro view thing going on with grass. And then grass also is sort of like, we don't think about it, it's everywhere, and we kind of, you know, it's sort of generic and, and you know, like void of any sort of like strong connotations. However, it kind of isn't in a way. I mean, I, I feel like we all know what it means to like grow up in a house where you have like, you know, acres and acres of manicured lawn and people come once a week and tend to it versus growing up in a house where you have like a, you know, a small, a small humble lawn and you're, you know, you're required to mow it, you know, once a week or whatever versus growing up in an apartment building where you don't see any grass. So, I mean, in a way it was, it's kind of like, it's totally not loaded, but it is sort of loaded. And I just thought it was very well suited to this concept of like a big American factory. So, so anyway, grass was the, the product that was being produced each day. And then it ended up being like really, like it worked out so well because the, the concept was that the, the piece was producing its own sod roof. So at the beginning of the exhibition, I think I have an image. Well, I'll show you in just a second. So actually, let me just get back to that in a moment. But this is a picture of one of the gardeners coming to do the work. So she's in the greenhouse and she's preparing the new boxes of, of sod and um, getting ready to take the mature sod to the roof. So there, there you see the roof in the, the beginning of the exhibition. Um, there were these dumb waders built into the structure so that the gardeners could just place the boxes on these little lifts and they would lift up and then they would enter into the back of the structure and pop up through the roof and then arrange the grass on the roof. So here's like probably midway through the exhibition. It's about halfway covered. So this, this, this idea that like the piece is becoming even more performative is obviously becoming much more important to me. Um, but I didn't really want to see it as a performance. I wanted this to be real work. So these gardeners were paid. Uh, they had, this is towards the end of the exhibition obviously. Um, they had a little uniform, they had lockers, which I'll show you in a second. Um, they had a uniform, by that I mean a t-shirt. <laughs> um, I also had the museum get them um, like MP3 players so they could listen to music so people wouldn't come up and start asking them to just, you know, explain the piece in any way. So they were, they were doing real work and it was kind of cool because like two of them were really into it and one of them was not and she just needed money and so like on two days of the week it looked beautiful and then like the other day it was kind of like scrappily done but it was like, you know, I was okay with that because it was, it was as real as it possibly could be. So just to explain what's going on here, obviously when the sod comes out of the factory, uh, it starts to shrivel up and die. So you see this whole life cycle happening where at the end of the, this is like probably the last week or so of the exhibition, um, you know, there's at the front of the piece, there's this fresh new grass and at the back, it's just gnarly like hay. It looked terrible. So ultimately this exercise was a dead end. It was all about just going through the exercise and the event unfolding each day. Uh, this is a view of the gardeners, lockers, and the coat check room. And I wanted everything to be visible so that their presence was known and, um, and it, was, it was real. I included a few uh, shots of us installing this piece just because it was such a technical 
nightmare to get this thing installed. So we worked for a few weeks in an off-site location preparing the conveyor belts and then brought them into the gallery and, and um, immediately after we hooked up the conveyor belts and started them running, we had to build this, this structure, custom built, tight, tight fit right around this conveyor belt. It was crazy. And then in an off-site location, I had to prepare the grass ahead of time so that on the, the opening day of the exhibition, there was something on the conveyor belt loop. So this was in an off-site location. We were preparing all the grass in stages so that it was staggered and appropriate for you know, the, the scheduling of, the, of, the, um, of each week. This morning's shots, technical headaches galore. So I installed these emerald green safety glasses in these little cubbies on the outside of the structure uh, because the grow lights gave off this horrible, like, he very fake looking and very horrible, sickly looking, like, heat lamp um, color. So if you were stepping up to the window, you could put these emerald green glasses on and it gave you, like, a more beautiful, you know, view of the grass going by. And the grass was videotaped and there were cameras. You could see it moving through the factory. Basically, like, I wanted people to see grass in every, in every dif different way and different perspective. I mean, it was like going up the dumbwaiters. It was going around. Um, it was, you know, growing in the greenhouse. It was dying. I just, I wanted it to just be like, like a, just a, a, you know, you were experiencing this, this product in a variety of different ways. And this is perhaps one of my favorite views because you're, this is the moment where you're like entering into, into the interior room of the factory and you're stepping over the conveyor belt. There's this little bridge that we built. So you're stepping over the conveyor belt loop and it's actually like the moment where you, the grass is under your feet, which is how we normally experience in real life. However, you're like stepping into this interior space and kind of like, you know, um, entering into a new sort of like logic or a new world or system. There were little windows built into the structure so you could see it going by. There were also aquariums built into the walls that were just functioned as like portholes and ways of looking into, you know, from one room to the next and just trying to make this as, you know, a complicated of experience as possible because the actual structure itself was kind of, like I said before, it was sort of this just dumb wedge. So I needed to really make this thing about looking into something, not looking at something. In the interior room of the factory, there were all these little sort of, I don't know what to call them, like corporate trinkets or corporate giveaways that were on, in display in these little boxes that were, that were printed with this logo, which was the logo that was representing my factory. So there were golf balls and pencils and t-shirts and all these little trinkets that you might find if you were like visiting a, a factory and, and you know, on your way out, there was like a gift shop or something. So I wanted to sort of like, like legitimize my factory and have all these things for sale and then you could actually go into the museum gift shop and and buy them so it was sort of like a way to like blur the boundaries between my institution and the institution of the museum so i came across this picture as i was researching all these little corporate trinkets and everything and i fell in love with this golfer's water dispenser and so I decided to make a, a quick sculpture that was sort of an homage to this. And this was in the, the little interior room of the factory. So this is the sculpture that I came up with. And it's a, a little fountain that um, there's flowing orange Gatorade flowing through this, this igloo cooler. And it was, it was just like my attempt at like a visitor's welcome fact fountain. I don't really even know what that means, but it's sort of, it was, it's funny how like oftentimes there's, after so many like, you know, weeks and months of work on something, at the very end there'll be some like weird little thing that like maybe doesn't totally make sense, but it's the thing that I'm very interested in and it's the thing I like obsess about and that oftentimes is, is the thing that leads me to the next project. So I built this within the final days of that installation and it actually in fact became sort of the springboard for the next project, which I'll show you, which is this. Um, this is a piece that I did uh, for the biennial in 2008, and the title of this is While Enhancing a Diminishing Deep Down Thirst, the Juice Broke Loose, the Birth of a Soda Shop. I do not recommend making titles <laughs> that long. It always like embarrasses me to read that, but anyway. Um, so that's the title for this piece, and this is basically a much more complicated version of that Gatorade fountain that I just showed you before. So. 
um, I feel like I was, I was sort of noticing a shift, whereas before my pieces had, I mentioned the, the A side and the B side of the pieces, now that had sort of morphed into this weird lemon, lime, and orange thing happening. So the fountain is fitted with um, these um, four aquariums, and they're um, each you know, hooked up to a barrel of, of this Gatorade, those two different flavors, and it just it pumps up to the top aquarium, overflows into the lower one, and down to the bottom. It's just cycling each day, really not doing anything much more than that. And in the top aquarium, there are fresh cut flowers which are sitting in this Gatorade. And the idea, I came across this idea, it's like a, it's, it's like a elementary school science project, like do flowers live longer in sugar water or Gatorade or whatever. And I was sort of tinkering with this and trying, trying to come up with a way to like make this concept of a fountain quirky and scientific and, and function and, and produce something. So this was my answer to this. So. Anyway, so it's just it's flowing through these fountains and um, getting rapidly disgusting over the course of each week. And so it, the, the, the barrels had to be changed out each week. So um, I reserved a bottle of this Gatorade that had been you know, enhanced by these flowers or like Whitneyized somehow or just this, this new version of Gatorade. I reserved in these bottles and that's what these two refrigerators um, are for in the, in the piece. So at the, end of the, um, at the end of the exhibition, the refrigerators were filled with all of this um, Gatorade. But I totally underestimated how disgusting this Gatorade became, was going to become. And I think it was like hard alcohol by the end of it. It was so fermented and disgusting. And it was my intention to like try to do something with this Gatorade after the fact, but that was not possible. These bottles swelled up like bombs and I like had to get rid of them. So unfortunately, this piece didn't ultimately end up like producing anything of significance. But it was this idea that this, you know, this fountain was like, you know, performing this strange scientific experiment in producing these, these, um, this enhanced Gatorade. So from that project, so just a detail, from that project I jumped to this next project, um, which was at, again at the Zach Foyer Gallery in, in the fall of 2008, and the title of this is Tickle the Shitstem. And um, where I had been before interested in a fountain, I was now sort of like tweaking that idea into this concept of a soda shop. So this is the one view of the structure, and this is like sort of a little platform where people could come and sit and hang out on this structure, and um, there was music playing. And I'll show you in a second the, this is the, this is the interior of the shop. So um, inside the shop they were selling obviously soda, sodas that were orange and lemon-lime color. Um, T-shirts, candy, seashells, some things that made sense, some things that didn't, totally did not make sense. But um, the idea was that there were people in this shop each day and they were engaging with the public. So here's sort of the starting point of the, of the system or the shit system. Um, the T-shirts were used. So the, um, the idea was that they were washed each morning. And so there's the washing machine, and then the water that came out of the washing machine um, didn't go down a drain. It went through this, this filtration system that I had designed. And it purified it enough so that it could be used to water plants. So once it made its way through the system, it pumped around the corner back into this main structure. And the people who were attending the shop used it to dye seashells, water plants, um, refill bottles. I mean, there were all these like weird little chores that I dreamed up. And some of them were sort of rational and legit, and some of them were totally irrational. It was just a way to like use up this water. So the problem of the day was what to do with this, you know, 12 gallons of water that came out of the um, washing machine. And the more that viewers participated in the shop, and the more seashells they bought, and the more um, soda they bought, and they generated these empty bottles and created these voids, the, the more we could um, the, like, then we, it used up more water, said that in a weird way. So um, the system ultimately like, became a shitstorm and got shitty really quickly if, if like, viewers didn't participate and buy into this, this whole scenario. Um, and so um, that was sort of the, the scheme of it all. And um, pretty much every day it got shitty. So uh, people... <laughs> You know, some people thought it was fun and like bought into it and, and bought sodas and hung out, but um, it was mostly like very popular with children. So they weren't they weren't um, 
spending as much money <laughs> as I thought they were going to. So um, things were actually sold very cheaply. It was just more about this exchange of like creating a dialogue and, 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 and setting up a scenario that played out each day where the viewer could dip into it. I mean, I feel like I had for so many years enjoyed this concept of skimming off of other systems. And so this was a way to like set up a system and see if the viewer would, you know, I say dip into it, but participate um, or tickle it, hence the title, Tickle the Shit System. Okay, so I don't even know if this is legible from where you are, but this is a storyboard for the next generation of that project, which is was called Kampfschutzstum, the New Deal. I did this project a year later in Germany at a contemporary art center, and um, I wanted to take that the concept of the Schutzstum and just um, sort of explode it and make it even more complicated. So um, here is a, a view of the floor plan. And here is the room itself. Um, so it was a two-floor exhibition. The bottom floor was basically the like boiler room to the whole thing. So the whole system basically played out in this bottom room. And um, before, where it was a shitstum, now it was a shitstum. So it was a competition. So there's two washing machines, and it's sort of basically the same same concept. T-shirts are washed each day in each machine. 12 gallons comes out, 12 gallons of water comes out, dirty water, and it goes through a system of filtration, passes through, you know, sand filters, charcoal filters, whatever it takes to, like, you know, purify it enough so that the water is usable for various chores. The water arrives at this fountain, which you see here in the center of the room. There are folding chairs um, clustered around this fountain, and the fountain has two different sides to it. One is represented with orange and one is represented with yellow. And the water from both machines you know, pumps into this fountain and th this fountain is hooked up to a computer program which is playing archived baseball games. So each team is represented by either side of the fountain and the games, um, I, I scored them and entered them into these computer programs and then the, act the um, events in a baseball game were um, sort of uh, translated into um, calibrated pump time. So, for example, a single would rep was represented by 10 seconds of water pumping, and a double 20 seconds, and a triple 30 seconds, and so on and so on. So ultimately, the more successful baseball team pushed more water through its system and its side of the fountain. So after two hours of a game being played, there was a barrel of winning water and a barrel of losing water. This is the inside of the fountain. You can see all the barrels and hoses. So. Um, this is the computer that was there playing the game. So ultimately, the winning water pumps up through a stairwell in the museum and arrives at this um, top floor, which I'll show you in just a second. And the losing water remains downstairs in the basement. And uh, people who are tending to this piece each day make use of the water, again, through various chores, some of them rational, some of them totally irrational, watering plants, refilling containers, doing all sorts of stuff. But basically, it was, it was a way to try to suffocate and control this room by way of mapping, through, mapping the space out through this system. So, um, you know, the, the room was filled with cords and hoses and water was, you know, moving from one location to the next and creating a void and filling it, creating a void and filling it. it was basically, it was a way to just kind of like seize the, the room and, um, and control it through the system. There was an area in the room that I um, kind of cordoned off, which is what you see here, and it was sort of like a satellite uh, studio. Um, and I had begun these sculptures, and then um, over the course of the exhibition, the people who were working in, the, in, the, um, working in this piece finished off the sculptures. And the sculptures each related to either the winning or losing team for that day. And so, um, and the, the water, let's see, I should back up, I'm sorry, I didn't really explain that well. So I prepared the, all these Frisbee inserts, and then the person tending the piece would um, take one chair from the cluster of chairs around the fountain, mix the losing water in with the plaster, fill the bottom of the chair, and press this stamp in it. And it was sort of like these things were sort of like a, a physical embodiment of like the events of the day, the system of the day, the baseball game, my studio, their activities in that, um, in the exhibition, just kind of like drawing together all these sources um, that 
didn't really make all that much sense. And um, forcing them in this sort of like um, heavy physical uh, form, and then you know the, each chair was stamped with like the date and the time and their name and my name, and it was sort of like you know drawing together all of these things. Ooh, okay, so this is the top room. Um, so the water that was the quote-unquote winning water pumped up through a stairwell, made its way around this structure, eventually made its way into these ponds. And um, at some point, oh, here's a view of the hoses going around the outside of the structure. The structure was huge. It was crazy. At some point, the ponds filled to capacity, and the whole system was, like, totally plumbed and filled up and, like, you know, at maximum capacity, and at that point, a light went on downstairs, a valve was switched, and the water from those ponds got pumped back down to the washing machines, and that was the water that was used to run the machine. So it was really cool. At some point in this exhibition, the piece, obviously it wasn't like off the grid, but it started to spin away from the institution, and it was like running on its own momentum in a way. So that was pretty exciting. So this is a piece that I just, um, took down a couple months ago uh, in New York City. This is the last piece I'm going to show. I'm sorry, this is a lot to go through. Um, and the title of this piece is Nunderwater Nort Lab. And this was at um, Zach Fourier Gallery. And the dimensions of this are uh, around 26 feet long by 26, 23 feet wide by 14 feet tall. And um, this is kind of the, like the B-side to the last two pieces I was describing. Um, in the previous two pieces, the system was open and inviting people to participate in it. And in this project, I wanted to completely do the opposite, and I wanted to like shut out the viewers. Um, so this was a completely sealed structure, and there was a door that was locked, um, and there were, the viewers only had access to the interior of the space by way of these sort of portholes, or I call them wormholes. Um, which were like long kind of wooden tunnels where you could peer into and they were sort of undulating. You could get kind of glimpses of what was going on on the inside. So on the inside, there was an activity happening each day, and it was completely also totally different from what was going on in the previous projects. I sort of wanted to strip away all of those like strange references and sources and just do something that really made sense in the space and, and also was in a very real way grounded not only to the site, but to the context of what was going on in there. So every day, um, volunteers came and worked in this piece, and they prepared lunch. And lunch was served to not only the gallery staff, but to the volunteers also. And the structure was, as I mentioned before, completely closed to the public. However, it was open to the people who helped build it, me, anyone I wanted to bring in, and the gallery staff. So it was a structure that was, I mean, I, I guess I was sort of like, really celebrating this concept of a treehouse. So like anyone who was a part of building this thing could go in and enjoy it, but basically it was, you know, it was sealed off. There were little like holes cut in it so you could kind of get glimpses of what was going on inside. So there was a little kitchen in there um, and again, like in the previous projects, there was wastewater that was generated and that water was filtered and processed enough so that we could use it to water plants. Um, but there really wasn't, and this is a view of the kitchen, there really wasn't any sort of like elaborate crazy system happening. It was really just about like this, this small community of people coming inside this structure and, you know, a bit of a shift of context because you're eating lunch inside a sculpture. But it was really, you know, it was a rational act that, had, that was going to happen anyway every day in the gallery. So I decided it was sort of a logical thing to um, build the sculpture around. There's the little dishwasher. And there's the filtration system. And this is one of the plant watering stations. This totally sort of harkens back onto that crazy idea of the second generation watering station that I talked about before in Los Angeles. This, these, like, these plants on the top got watered and they drained down to the next level and down to the next level. So sort of making use of that crazy logic from years before. And this is sort of a view of almost the entire like, kind of panoramic view of the inside. So I did get some mixed reactions from people who were kind of um, irritated by the fact that they weren't allowed in this structure. This is um, a view of peering in through the fan on the door. Um, and so you could get glimpses of what was going on in there. But it, it, was, it was sort of strange. It wasn't my intention to be exclusive. It was really just about sort of like 
um, well, a few things, but one of the things I was really interested in was like making a connection between my studio and, and what was going on inside this structure. And also about sort of celebrating the fact that this was for the people who built it in a way. And so just kind of creating this sort of like environment for the, for the community who helped build it. So it was, it, was, it was strange the way, you know, some people were definitely not down with the fact that they couldn't go inside of it. But, um, oh, that's that. So... I don't know how to take it to black. I forgot how to do that. Someone mentioned that earlier. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I can just put maybe this back up so we don't have to stare at my <laughs> desktop. Um, what did you uh, study for undergrad at Tulane? I, um, let's see, I, I originally took, I wasn't sure if I was going to major in art, but I, I started taking like basic drawing classes and then I took a glass sculpture class um, and I became really excited about that and I did that for a while and then my senior year, I kind of moved away from glass and just started taking sculpture classes. But, um, but yeah, it was sort of a funny way to get into sculpture. I loved working with glass when it, we were in the hot shop and there was a team of people like working on glass, but I always hated the end result when I had this like, you know, fragile glass object and I never knew how to resolve that. But, um, but I think, um, I think maybe working with the team of people in the hot shop was like probably maybe an early lesson that I, you know, was kind of enjoying at the time. And I can see now looking back on my work, like maybe that was something that sort of influenced what I do now. So I was uh, fortunate enough to see your piece at the Whitney, and uh, one thing I was curious about is your use of Gatorade, and um, it seems as though almost all your materials come from some sort of salvaged act. You know, you've, you've repurposed something, and then there's this like commercial aspect, you know, Gatorade, the logo, the corporation. So I was wondering if you could speak to that, and also there are so many different colors of Gatorade out there nowadays that I wonder why you um, default to just using the two classic colors as opposed to like some of the more pastel, um, you know, Riptide Rush or any of those <laughs> other terms that are out there. Thank you. Um, so, okay, good question. I, I didn't mention why I started folding Gatorade into my work. Um, I started seeing, I started seeing a parallel with what I was doing in my process. Um, with what I was doing and with sports. Um, I start, my work is very physical. Um, I, I have, have always, I guess I didn't really pay attention to it um, early on, but a lot of my work, as I mentioned before, was not typical studio work. It was like hauling stuff, loading stuff. And so I always kind of, I mean, I, at first I didn't really pay attention to it, but then I started like kind of listening to that a little bit more. And then I also realized that, um, I felt like the installations felt like a team sport when I had a crew of people working with me. So I just started like allowing for these sports references to come in. I happen to really like sports as well, but um, but that's sort of I guess a, a side thing. But so okay, so I was sort of comfortable with allowing my work to open up to that. I must say that the Gatorade thing kind of is a little bit of a personal narrative. I used to work for a, a glass artist when I was a student at Tulane and. One of my jobs, we had to work from every morning, every, every Saturday morning was like the worst time to employ college kids to make your art for you, but we had to work at the, um, bright and early every Saturday morning. And my job, my first job when I arrived in the studio was to mix an enormous 
uh, igloo cooler of Gatorade every morning for the crew. And this was like horrible New Orleans heat. <laughs> Everyone was like hung over and we had to like mix this Gatorade and then we had to work for hours in the hot shop and wear these leather suits and this guy was kind of like a jerk about it. So it was just like something that stuck with me always about this, this concept of Gatorade. So that definitely, um, you know, played, played a role in why I started uh, using Gatorade. And as for the colors, um, I, I don't know if you noticed on some of the pieces there were these like bright um, colored little dots on the back of the structures. Um, and they're actually like um, fluorescent stickers that I put on the, um, the, the pointy screws that came out through the back of the wood because I re for a long time I was recycling everything and so I was even using like these super long drywall screws when it really wasn't necessary so they would like poke through the layers of wood and then I didn't know how to resolve that because it was like not only ugly but like treacherous when you were trying to walk by so I started putting these stickers on it and I always gravitated towards these fluorescent fluorescent orange and yellow because it was bright and it was sort of like a caution <laughs> color. So I think from, from that I sort of um, stuck with those two colors um, just to control the palette somewhat and not to have it like look too crazy. Um, although I must say some of the pieces have so much fluorescent in them that like you can't even, you know, it does look crazy. But, um, but that's, that's sort of how that came to be. There's someone down here, and there's someone in the middle. <laughs> someone in the front there? You in the front. Um, we'll throw some in you. Um, looking at the evolution of your work, I had the sensation that uh, since the earlier uh, work that you showed us, the relationship with the city, or the work with the city, uh, along with the um, physical means and the design and the social means of the process uh, through which the, the, the work gets to, to life changed a lot. So I was wondering, um, what is your plan um, for the future, if you're interested at all, into bringing um, back the work to the street? Or... Uh, Somehow, how do you, uh, w which place this ambiguity that you, that, that is in your work uh, about uh, space, city, uh, inside, outside, corporate or institutional space um, will, uh, will evolve? Um, okay, let me see. That was kind of a lot. Let me see if I can... So you were asking like how the city and the environment that I made these pieces has affected the pieces in, is that me? Or is that, <laughs> you guys are, okay. Um, so you're asking whether or not this, this, the city and the environment in which I work has affected the pieces and if maybe there's gonna be sort of like a return to that environment in some way or if I've ever, yes. okay. Um, um, well, definitely the city and my, my space and my routine and where my studio is completely has influenced my work. I, I know for a fact that if I worked in another um, place or another country, my work would be so different. In New York City, space is at a premium. People throw stuff out all the time. It's like unreal. So I'm, I'm absolutely positive that that has had a huge impact on my work. Um, in terms of working in public space, I, I would really love to. I, the only project that I've ever done that even comes close to that is the, the project that I showed you that was in that um, lobby of the, the Philip Morris's corporate headquarters. And so that was like quasi-public, but it was still like kind of protected within the context of a lobby and, and the context of a understood art program. Um, you know, an exchange between the corporate um, setting and this, you know, this art program. So it really wasn't completely, you know, out there. But that's the closest thing I've ever done um, to working in a space like that. And I was so excited about that project because that lobby was so 
alive and like thriving and complicated and strange. Um, so I really like that idea. And I think that um, some of the ideas that I most have most recently been interested in, this idea of like um, building a, a structure uh, who that's in service to the very people who help build it. I, I think that idea could maybe translate in a very interesting way to public space somehow. Um, I just haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, did I answer your question? I feel like it was a big question. I'm not sure if I touched on everything. <laughs> sure. I'm just wondering if there's a dimension of um, environmental activism in your work because so much of it deals with like salvaged objects and water conservation and um, found objects and recycling things. And I'm just wondering if that's part of your intention when you're planning your ideas. I would say that um, it's definitely there. There are definitely undercurrents and in some projects like they're sort of stronger currents than in other projects. I wouldn't say, I, I think I would be, I'd be lying if I said it was actually the starting point for the project. Um, I, um, I do very much like the look of like older seasoned things rather than buying new, new stuff. And because of, I work on such a large scale, it's just like, it's too expensive to buy. Um, brand new wood each time and it just makes sense to reuse stuff so there's just a lot of like um, for various like sort of fundamental logistic reasons that I also recycle and reuse a lot of stuff but I, I must say that I, I um, and I was actually speaking with someone today in their studio about this I, I get um, kind of paralyzed with um, like a, the concept of a clean slate and like the concept of starting something from from nothing, so I much prefer to like gather materials that already have information on them, or or problems with them, or things that I have to overcome because it's already giving me kind of like a starting point. Um, so, um, so those are a few reasons why I sort of started working in that in that vein. But um, I know that. Um, I know that I'm very aware that, like, especially with the, this this concept of like water filtration and and you know using the recycling the water to water plants, I I, I see that those um, those issues are, are there, but I, I tend to try to like not um, overemphasize them too much because I feel like the pieces are about so many other things, and it's so easy to kind of just um, like oversimplify them and say like, oh yeah, that's about you know. It's about recycling and water conservation or whatever, and then like not really look at all the other elements that are happening because I, f I feel like they're, they're, they're complicated and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but so I guess yes and no <laughs> is the short answer. I think we have time for one more question. <clears throat> Anyone? This isn't a question. I just loved the last photograph. I loved the structures of the inside of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, of the sculpture. Thank you. <laughs> and I wonder if you could do something with that um, that would let us see more of that because often these things are so high or in some ways, not vis parts of them aren't visible, and um, the inside was particularly wonderful. And it would be great to be able to see it more of it, maybe photographs or anything. Hmm. But I lo I just loved it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>